Wonderful. So, wasps fit. Prepare to be underwhelmed, okay? Very little new ideas here. What you're probably gonna get at the end of this is, oh great, at wasps, they do some worst case scenario stuff. They mix it with some training. Everyone's been doing that for years, all right? No problem at all. When I get the chance to go see, see groups and listen to people talk, I do not care about what they do. The big one is about how they got there in the first place. That's the really interesting bit for me. And so I'm gonna try and give you, force my per personal preference down your throat and talk a lot about the process rather than actually um, how we implement it. So I apologize um, to start with. So here's the little story that we'll go through. This will flash up loads of times. First thing in being wasps fit is what is my definition of fitness? Too many animations, all right, cool. So before I can even say this is what drill we're doing, this is how we're doing it, this is what we're doing on what day, I need to know what fitness means. Now I'm not a man for semantics, I don't care if you call this fitness, conditioning, whatever, it doesn't bother me. We don't need to argue about those nuances. All right, so if you hear me use the word fitness or conditioning, this is what I mean. Force is king. So every movement that happens, be it in the first minute or the last minute of a rugby uh, game, a football game, hockey, bobsled, whatever, force production is everything. It is movement. It is how we move from A to B faster than someone else, how we uh, apply certain forces to different objects to win the game. Okay, so our players or our sportsmen and sportswomen have to have a high capacity for peak force. And when I talk about force as well, it's not just force as in itself. It could be impulse, rate of force development, reactive strength, whatever you want. That is what I mean from it. The application of that force is massively important. So how are we applying forces to the ground? So massive for sprinting, for example, with regards to, to recent research into horizontal application of force. How we strike a ball is application, it's affected by fatigue and so on. Finally, how does that force capacity react to the stresses that we're applying in our sport? Obviously someone from, Nor from Norfolk, okay. <laughs> Oops, okay. Um, so the best way to do it is in a graph format. All right, so when, I'm a, uh, when I've got zero stresses, zero fatigue, I can harness, I can express 100% of my force capacity. Okay, this doesn't take into account environmental uh, chronic factors. This is very much a, a talk about acute fatigue and acute fitness. Um, as more stresses are added, so this could be time in game, this could be number of actions in the game, amount of high speed running in the game. My ability to produce force could be for a sprint, could be for a change of direction or so on, reduces at a given rate. The blue player for me is less fit than the yellow player for the same given stresses. Okay, so the yellow player here has the same, uh, sorry, it's 100% capacity of force at zero stress. As the same stress is applied, they're able to produce more given force. So in a very practical manner, if two people can run 10 meters per second um, at the 50 meter mark, okay, after a same given amount of stress, the, bl the uh, blue player will be running slower than the yellow player. And what I've learned over the years is it's not just the peak force capacity or the performance force capacity of the player that matters, it's how that force responds to a given stress. And that is fitness from my perception of things. Okay, fitness in my sport. So now we start getting a bit more deterministic. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna look at rugby a little bit more. Way too many animations. Okay. I might just do the old fashioned. Wonderful. Now you need to play. I'm sorry, man. I'm absolute crap here. Oh, there we go. Okay, okay. All good. Cheers. Okay. So let's watch a bit of rugger, as the posh lads call it. So, Look at the variety of movements and muscle actions that happen. Fairly random intervals, incredible amounts of contact, repeated getting up off the floor, and then the time frames in which they happen as well. So this is a player cam on just one phase. 
different body heights, going from low to high and back to high again, different levels of skill. The next thing you'll see is called speed to breakdown. It's a skill in itself. This is number seven that we're following. My colleague, Luke Woodhouse, who for me is one of the, is the best s and I've ever worked with. If he worked in football, he'd be on a zillion a year. He works in rugby and he can't pay his rent. But Luke would call rugby physiologically impure. Um, so what, what, I talk, what, what I mean when I talk about that is that the amount of variation and variation in muscle actions, durations, volumes, intensities and, and uh, densities, the addition of contact to the mix means that translating classic physiology to our sport is really complex. It's multifaceted. I would love to individually profile my players on how their energy system interacts with different, uh, uh, different time frames of exercise and so on. But if there's any, uh, there's some very smart professors, doctors in the room, if you can translate your classic Joyner and Cole, your classic deterministic models of uh, endurance performance, a cycling coach who no, who no doubt has that stuff in his coaching Bible, if you can translate that to rugby, teach me, please. Because until then, the classic physiology and even more modern uh, physiology, who's the guy doing the anaerobic speed reserve? Real intelligent guy. He's uh, working, sorry? Bruce Wright. No, he's um, working in Canada. Anyway, sorry, forgot his name. I love his stuff. Incredibly intelligent. When it comes to applying that type of work, working out a maximal anaerobic speed for a rugby player, what the hell is their maximal anaerobic speed? Every time they just get a few steps in, they're on the floor, they're getting hit, they're getting back up. It's really complex, and I'm not complaining about that. I love the challenge, okay? I would almost not want to work in a running base sport because the challenge here is absolutely fantastic. Now, we know that intensity, volume, and duration are massive mediators of fatigue, and I'm going to talk about them uh, a, lot, a lot later. But now my job is to go into a rugby club and go, this is how we should train. This is how I'm gonna get our players fit for the way that we want to play rugby. And I'm left with two options. The physiology approach is the option that I just can't take. I would love to take the physiology approach. Ronan, you just uh, included it in your one when you did your uh, MAS test, and you use that to determine where the strengths and weaknesses of your players are and then where they need to train. Fantastic. We're not ready for that in rugby, in my opinion. I'm certainly not. So I have to look at a demands approach. What do my players have to do to win matches? And then I will, you know, people say reverse engineering. I'll just work backwards from that. I nearly used it just for the camera. Okay. So now I'll explain what WASPs fit means. We now know what fitness means in my, in my waffly brain. We're gonna go through to what it means for WASPs. I was much less of a strength and um, crap strength and conditioning coach. I was much less back in the day before I started using deterministic models properly. Now I don't understand how we can create a program without having uh, a Bible deterministic model of our sport and how we want to play. I just don't know how I would design a session without knowing how it relates all the way to the top. And I'm going to go through that. This is still around our demands approach. I'm also going to look, uh, give you an idea as to how I analyze performances, work back from them to create uh, sessions that will be of the most high quality possible we can do at WASPs. So deterministic models at WASPs. That's my favorite question up there to ask a coach constantly. It needs refreshing because the game plan changes. I've been at WASP three seasons. We had a new game plan this season and it changed things completely. We had to rejig everything we did from a strength and conditioning point of view. And you know what? No problem at all. Because my job is to support how will we win rugby matches. So I asked my coach, we asked the head coach, we asked the coaches, how will we win? And they provide me with some key actions in the game plan. I can't put that up on the slides today. All right, we're already ninth in the league. Can't afford more drops down from there with other teams knowing how we're going to play against them. Okay, but simply, he gives a key action. I want to be good at this. I want our team to be good at this. Our backs need to be the best in the league at this. Do you know what? I'm pointing it there. I need to be pointing it there. 
34 years old and absolutely stupid as. Okay, so I then split that into my model of fitness, <clears throat> which is my force capacity and application, and how does that respond to fatigue? We can then break that down even further, so we can uh, we, we look at certain underpinning competencies and the standards required of our players to be excellent further up the model. We're not going to get into that, thankfully. All right. So here's an example. As a, as a team, it's common knowledge, we want to be the best team at winning kick battles in the league. So a kick battle, for those who are not, uh, not familiar with rugby, and the ball is kicked deep, you then look to win a kicking metres battle, but it requires a superb chase from your team every time the ball is kicked. It's a bit like pinball, and we have to be very, very good at it. So Lee Blackett, head coach, George, we've got to have these boys fit enough to win the kick battle. Right, what does that mean? So I break down what kind of forces are going to be required, how many times they're going to have to um, express that force, so the density of it, the intensity of it, the, the volumes that we might get in a game, and then we look at the underpinning physical and physiological factors that we then need to train. So before I go ahead, the whole force side of the, the, the deterministic model, I'm not going to talk about today. It's, you probably know from the general culture of rugby that we look to improve force capacity all the time in our players. The force uh, is through, through uh, a resistance training methods. Um, it's a big part of the training. The, um, the application side of things, we have excellent coaches. Uh, that improve motor patterns, that improve the skill of movement all the time, especially from a rugby specific point of view. And then Lukey Woodhouse uh, does a lot with speed kinograms and so on to improve how players apply force in a sprint. So that's covered. What we're going to look at today is, uh, is this side of the model here. All right, once I know that, now I need to look at our model versus what we're already doing. So you remember this triangle from earlier? with regards to demands, fatigue, and execution. Now I look at a game here, and I go, okay, there are three ways that I can do this, and you'll notice this is not data first. So I realize I'm at a, a, my expenses are being paid by um, people that create data out of technology. That is not the way I would go first, and that's my personal preference. All good. Roof, I'm sorry, mate. Um, I do have a video of me using GPS later, so that will make up for it, lovely. Okay. Um, I look for patterns in a game as when we are crap, when things go wrong, or when the demand is extremely high. And then we will look to overload them at a later date. So, negative execution. Is there a, a grouping in the game? Are there certain times in a game where we have failed to handle the ball correctly, where we have missed breakdowns, where there's been a lot of drop balls, where the game plan has not gone uh, to play because we physically were not able to do it. I don't look at that moment. I look before that moment. I, I then maybe use uh, something like GPS, more often than not, just my eye, to look at what is happening. It, was it difficult? Are we already training it? Um, if it is difficult, we need to overload it. Are we already training it? We'll get, to, we'll get to that later. I look at when there's incredible amounts of fatigue. Now again, it's going to have to be fairly anecdotal and it's fairly, fairly flimsy. It wouldn't hold up in a research paper, but a lot of this is using my eye, using the coach's eye. The texts I get on Sunday mornings, typically from a head coach or attack coach, is George, look at minute 42. What the hell is he doing? What do you reckon? So I'll look at minute 42. So I look bang on, right in the middle of where we see that obvious fatigue-related reduction in capacity to do your job. I look before that as well, because it's not just that moment that matters. It is maybe what has created fatigue prior to that moment that we can train. Maybe that player was already in such a low force-producing application state that it looked bad there, but it was the stuff we did before. Typically, typically, and this is a loose example, you'll see a big front row player, so 130 kilo player, 
slogging his way round the corner and not getting to his, uh, his, defensive, his defensive place. We miss the tackle or there's a gap. Team goes through and scores. Back in the day, I would have heard, George, he is crap at running. And I would have gone, yeah, he is. Look, I saw the, I saw the video. Let's get him better at running. Absolute rubbish. It is not the moment that matters. It is the bit before. And that is where I've got most of my gold from. Oh, I say it's gold. Uh, <laughs> most of my copper from in terms of producing uh, high quality ideas, I hope to, to uh, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our players from a fitness point of view. The third target that you'll see is after the event has happened. And that is of course around acute recovery. So how is that player recovering? Potentially, potentially, and especially when we can use heart rate in training, that gives me an idea, potentially, of the general aerobic system effectiveness of that player with regards to replenishment of PCR, blah, 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 blah. Can they get up a minute later and do the job properly? Does it take them two minutes to get back into the game? Three minutes. There's maybe some insight there. And then I look at demand. And this is where I might go data, data first a little bit. Um, I think there's a, there's a video coming up soon. I might use things like maximal intensity period. I might, uh, the, the um, analysts will tag a lot of things for me and I'll look at dense periods where those tough events that they've tagged for me um, have happened. And I go, right, are we training that? No, we're not. Okay, that's on me. I'm now sending a player into the game unable to have any tolerance to that demand because I'm not training it. Are there any questions before I go on? Okay, here's an example of some analysis I created based off the data the analysts have given me. So we have things called effort habits and they are massive to me. They're absolutely massive because I can engage the players and the coaches brilliantly with these and they mean so much from a physical point of view. I actually in the I actually don't care about GPS that much with this team. Um, I care about effort habits. An effort habit, for example, is going from A, standing up, to B, the breakdown as soon as possible to stop the other team jackling on the ball. I'm not going to go through rugby now, but very simply, it's a skill that is actually a no talent effort required to go from A to B, go from a high body position to a low body position really quickly. The second habit we have is when we carry with the ball, how quickly does the player get up off the floor and get back into the attacking line so they show a really good picture so the defensive team now have more to think about or they're available for another carry. And then our third, our third habit is a defensive version of that one. I make a tackle, can I get back up quickly, plug a hole in our wall, in our defensive wall, give the attack loads to think about, force them into an error. So what I ask for is it, can I swear? This is, we call this the timeline of shit, okay? So this is from zero to 80 minutes, um, but that's the clock time, that includes half time and all the time in between when time's off. We call it a timeline of shit. Every uh, single number you see there is when one of those habits has not been done well by the player. So it's a binary score, they get yes or no. I, I put all the no's together for our team and I look at periods of shit, basically. Sorry for using that language, it's terrible. Okay, I then go and uh, match that up with the video on, uh, on Sonra, and I'll show you that later. And I look at the, the uh, running demands, the locomotive-based demands. I'll also use my eyes and look at the video and look at the contact-based demands, which I can also get from the analysts as well, etc., etc., etc. An example of a method of looking at uh, an execution-based failure from us and then trying to find uh, uh, physical solutions to solve the performance problem. Any questions around that? We got absolutely smashed by Quince. Um, we are terrible. We lost it in the first half. Okay. So this is what happens when you play for a kick-focused team like we do. And that's grand, I'm nothing against kick-focused game. We win games like this. So that's already four high-speed runs we've seen. Now we did well here. So that's our guy in the black shirt. We don't score a try, 
that his force generating capacity after four runs, absolutely brilliant. Then this is what happens straight after. I know I've sped through a bit, but this is a minute later. Very fatiguing period. Maximal intensity period was through the roof. Penalty monster. We were too slow to the breakdown. A lack of physical prowess or lack of official, uh, physical fitness from my definition. Here's a long mall. Loads and loads of running around. Loads and loads of running around. We do well during that period. We've won the line out. Okay, so we've got the ball back. So we did well in the moment. We did well in those tough moments. Poor effort habit. We lose the period. Ignore that for a sec. So with that video there, is an example of some key analysis we did when we were on a really terrible losing run. Okay, so a lot of this analysis was done, was done then. I wish I could do it every week, I can't. Um, why are we losing those key moments? We're fantastic in those tough periods. Okay, and we probably know why that's going well. It probably matched how we're training. And I'm a massive advocate for your performance will look like your training session. A massive advocate for that. But it's after those periods that we're really struggling. And then again, maybe you can go back to your deterministic model. What affects recovery? Well, it's the amount of work that's been done. If it's beyond the capacity that you're usually training, that recovery time frame is going to increase. And then maybe there's a physiological underpinning factor, such as the aerobic system, competency of the aerobic system, um, with regards force generating capacity, getting up to a nice high level again. Of course, something I haven't mentioned here is the top two inches. After we've done quite well, do we relax? Do we feel like we're entitled to attack? Do we feel like, oh, if I just miss this breakdown, it's grand? I haven't mentioned that. That is massive. That's a, sorry, I'm not saying we are mentally um, uh, in detriment at the club uh, for, from that, that point of view, but it's something that we work on all the time. All right. So this is using a Sonra software. You can stick the video in. You can buy Stat Sports at all good retailers. Okay. I find a kick chase. I can download that data. I look at the kick chases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Something that I've only started using this year, absolutely brilliant. I can't remember the guys in Aussie who used it at the University of Oregon and talked a lot about it. Um, rather than using meters per minute over a vast amount of time, I look at high metabolic load distance every 90 seconds for every second. And the Sonra software does that for me. Absolutely brilliant. All right. So that's a snapshot of the analysis that we do. I would be lying if I told you I did that after every game. I don't, okay? I do have a life. Um, we do more than that, okay, most of the time. Uh, but that is probably some of the more interesting stuff. And if I'm going to stand here and show off, I'm probably going to show you the best stuff, all right, to be honest. So what we now create are high fatigue moments that matter to being WASPs fit. Not just rugby fit, not just fit, but WASPs fit. Stuff that affects our game plan based off our deterministic model and when things go wrong for us. I split them into three categories. So we start with locomotive. I look at high metabolic load distance uh, for every 90 second period, um, every second for, for the game. We look at uh, volumes, intensities, densities of high speed like everyone else. We look at the number of kick chases that we'll do and the densities that they occur in. Okay. It correlates very, very closely with high speed, but because our deterministic model is all about kick chase, we're going to do it. Habits, those are the three that I explained to you earlier. Collisions, completely unmeasurable apart from a count. Um, just, just a very difficult thing to measure, but incredibly significant when it comes to recovery, uh, when it comes to fatigue, when it comes to uh, mindset in a game. I've never played rugby and you can probably tell because I'm weedy and my nose is still fairly straight. But you ask a player who's played a lot of rugby, the collisions they say are the worst part of the game. We also know that when we do the same small sided games and we add collisions in, heart rate will increase by five to 10%, five to 10 beats per minute, apologies. 
And then we look at time under tension for mauls and scrums. Again, you just have to watch one to know that it's absolutely horrific and we have to take it into account. Just because I have a GPS unit and it is an incredible piece um, of technology doesn't mean that's what I'm going to rely on because there is so much more going on in the game. And I've been in the position where I've come under huge fire from the player leadership group for just using uh, GPS. So back at Glasgow Warriors, and this was done in a, it was done in a very gentlemanly, nice way, um, arm round a shoulder, um, rather than taking me out for a drive and putting me in the passenger, front passenger seat and things like that. They told me I am affecting selection. I'm, I, my strength would be to engage coaches in the, in the training process. They would say that I'm affecting selection by just using GPS as a metric. That if someone scrummed for 15 seconds and then had to do running, I've just seen the running bit. Okay, so a blinkered approach. And they're absolutely right. Absolutely right with that. All right. Are we doing what we need to do to train these, uh, to train these key moments in games, to train these key fatiguing events? Okay, so as I explained earlier, force to take a demands first route. There's not enough time or information that I have to consider a physiology first route. And um, we, we, to, be, to be fair, we test uh, and we go for a physical first route from a force production point of view. It's pretty easy to do in a gym setting. Um, so, so that's covered, but certainly from a physiological energy systems approach based view, we, we don't do that very well at all. And I'm probably not gonna change. However, if I can't do that, what I'm gonna make sure is bloody effective is how I monitor our responses to training. Because the big, the big problem with not going physical and physiology first, or at least combining that, is that the game as a strength and conditioning coach or sports scientist, if you're looking for improvement and adaptation, is to create a stimulus that is gonna drive that adaptation. And so if I do not know if my training is creating a stimulus, then I can't be sure that I'm gonna get adaptation and all I'm doing is providing load or work for very little benefit. So you have to be incredibly critical of yourself. Is my training making a difference? And a, an example, really current example, Ronan used that example with, uh, with measuring minutes above uh, 4.5 meters per second. Okay, so an example of it done quite well. Uh, quite well, done well, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> okay. These three metrics, uh, basic principles of training, we learned them in GCSE PE, okay? The demands of a rugby match are not over 80 minutes. They come in clusters, and between those clusters, there are certain rest periods. So when I'm looking to overload something or understand if a player is lacking in an area, we split that whole wheel of fatiguing events into those three dimensions. I actually hate volume. Uh, it's probably where I was getting out with my question uh, earlier, um, that when we have uh, a 90 minute session and two players have got 200 meters of high speed running, yeah, I, and I don't have many answers for this, but I know that if one player got all of that in the first five minutes of the session, their general response and their general force, uh, force capacity throughout the rest of the session will be massively different from a player that got all their high speed meters in the last five minutes, which could also cause different kinds of problems as well. They're doing high speed meters under, under fatigue, then they can finish and recover. Player number one does all his high speed meters first, incredible uh, hamstring muscle, muscle fiber um, detriment, et cetera, et cetera. Then has to do the rest of the session with that, okay? But in my long-term plan, neither of them have spiked, so they both got 200 meters, but Anyway, I'm good. this is what goes on in my head constantly. It's, it's an absolute pain, people. Um, so I don't like volume that much uh, unless it is caveated with density um, and so on. Right. So I'm sorry this looks minging. This is just how I present it to... Um, this, is how we, this is what we work off at work. I didn't want to rejig it for you guys uh, necessarily. But um, very similar... similar um, to presentations earlier, a categorization um, of different uh, events that happen in rugby, and these are all from an intensity point of view. And this is, how am I going to overload? So the training principle of overload, what do I need to do to overload? 
uh, maul and scrum time under uh, maul and scrum time under tension. Well, it's nothing to do with the amount of time under tension I have. It is the forces being produced that that are required for an intensity overload. So three V5s or five V8s, with the three and the five respectively receiving an overload of specific force compared to a typical scrum or a maul. Typically, it's eight V8. Sorry. Same thing. Uh, Collisions, you can't overload collisions in training. So really, I'm going to X that one from what, when we try and overload it in, uh, in training because match collisions are the ultimate. And <laughs> you can't tell a player that we're going to overload the intensity of a collision in training, um, especially when they're twice the size of you. It's just not going to happen. Okay, volume-related metrics. Volume is still needs to be uh, taken into account. There is still a volume of work that is completed over 80 minutes of a rugby match. And here are my categories. So if we hit a red or if we hit a max purple, that for me, that counts as overload. That for me, that counts as I am probably providing a stimulus that will drive adaptation to create a tolerance to that kind of fatigue so we can recover faster and be better after those really long, tough or intense periods. And finally, uh, oh, sorry, probably an important one. We, we look at ball in play as well. Um, total ball in play for the game, total ball in play for a single period and so on. It's very different sports of football, which seems to almost be two 45-minute ball in plays, um, which is a completely different challenge to what we have. Uh, and then density, which I absolutely love, which is key. Um, Ronan, I think you said uh, you went into a club, they said they do loads of volume. You said I can get you fitter without doing that volume, probably because you utilise density metric. Easy peasy, no problem at all. We don't have to be there out there for an hour to be fit enough for an hour of, of rugby. Okay? We can just do it with shorter rest periods than they get on the, in a game at certain parts of our training. So um, ball in play in a 20 minute period. Uh, the hardest we've received this season is 11 minutes of ball in play in a 20 minute period. So can we create times in our training where we overload that or where we match that, sorry, because the purple and black uh, would be overload, red would still be overload, yellow, maybe I'm not that confident that we're getting a stimulus to drive adaptation for those upper echelon um, demands. I've never used the word echelon in my life until then. Okay. Thing I need to, something I need to know is, is what we're doing in training. Before I start going to the coaches and saying, I've got a plan, lads, uh, I need to know, oh, is, that, is that happening? All right? So I'll take my time over this. I'll let a few sessions go by. Don't get me wrong. While all this is happening, I'm not just twiddling my thumbs, smoking a fag and letting training happen. All right? We are always trying our best. Um, but we will do a ton of analysis. So peak 90 is what I would call my maximal intensity period. Uh, over 90 seconds. That's just the language we use that the coaches liked and the players liked. Okay, we played a team called uh, Worcester. Our day three was our key training day. Um, and we had a good session for those players in greens in terms of them hitting what I class as a significant peak 90 based off analysis of all our game peak 90s. Then we played Worcester. Um, different players got a peak 90 in the game against Worcester than they did in training. So uh, uh, Zach Kibarigi, for example, um, second bottom. Are we preparing him for the game? If that's happening con consistently, no, is the answer. And then we played uh, Team Munster. We got absolutely trounced by. Um, and that was what our training looked like that day. Just a lack of, for, that, that's on me, okay? That's me not being quick enough with my analysis. But it's then my job to make a difference, to make recommendations. So, now we'll get to the, uh, how we're we actually going to train. It's all well and good me knowing this stuff and keeping it all to myself and having all the numbers and all that. This is how we're going to do it. But there does have to be um, a cherry on the pudding. Okay, so, key principles for us. There has to be an adaptive response, and we've spoken about that. And there has to be a transfer. My two favorite principles of training that matter so much to me at the moment are specificity and then overload. Now, specificity is a little bit like politics, okay? If you go 
uh, too far left or right, you end up in a gutter, okay? A little bit of topical chat from me. Um, you, end up in the same, you end up in the same hole. With specificity comes overload as well. They are massively, massively related. If you have a complete lack of specificity, so if we did Bronco runs or MAS runs, uh, for me a complete lack of specificity to rugby, there would be incredible overload, an incredible density of high speed running above 60, 70, 80%, whatever. Incredible overload. So we're driving an adaptive response, absolutely. Gareth Sanford's the guy I was thinking of earlier. He would talk about that kind of training for team sports players. But where's the transfer? It's just not there. And I know there's gonna be some transfer because we know from classic VO2 max studies that if you, uh, if you have a group of cyclists and they do uh, running, then their cycling VO2 maybe increases a little bit, okay? And same with rowers um, and so on. There has to be some specificity there, of course. But when I create these overload blocks for the coaches and try and sell them to the coaches, because that's 50% of my job, without the coaches, I am absolutely nothing, okay? So when I am engaging the coaches in this rhetoric, I need to make sure that specificity is fulfilled. But the greater the specificity to the sport, the lower the overload is going to be. Okay, so if we add passing in there, average speed is going to come down of a, a straight line sprint. Um, Ronan, I'm no doubt in your crossing and finishing drill, without the ball, you'd get far greater speeds. And I bet sometimes you just want to go, lad, sprint from cone A to cone B, walk back, do it again. I'm absolutely sure, okay? We work in different environments and we can do different things. So when it comes to designing these things, I have to think they have to have some sort of specificity. But then again, 95% of our session is rugby. So does it have to be that specific? And if you look at a lot of the, if you look back at the rugby video, if you watch a rugby game next time, you'll see that so much of the work is done without the ball. So much is just physical graft going from A to B with uh, sometimes not that much movement variability, especially if you're stuck out on the other wing. Anyway, I'm chatting rubbish now. Have a think about those things when you're designing your own overload blocks, if you do. So this is our first attempt. It didn't work. We stuck an overload in. Don't get me wrong, overloads are bloody tough. All right, that's the point of them. They're tougher than anything a player has experienced in the game for that specific movement. That might have been 30 seconds of mauling for the forwards. Basically 16 lads having a, having a good old push off, okay? Rest for 10 seconds, 30 seconds of mauling. Actually not a great overload we found. Uh, it's so far overloaded um, that it created a fatigue that the boys actually just couldn't do the rest of the training for. So what we found is if we had overloads at the start, the rest of the session, technically, skill execution wise, was crap. Now that doesn't mean we won't revisit that, but we weren't ready for it. And a massive uh, principle of training is progression. So maybe one day we'll get back there. That might be the ultimate session that if your players can survive that with still with excellent rugby execution, then you've done your job. So then we move on. We make sure that the coaches, the coaches get a period of real quality, quality rugby. So you'll see that at the start, they had uh, our, our training is typically 15 on 15. It's probably the need for overload in our training. Um, and we then go into a bout of density where overload and gameplay is interrelated and so on. Like I said, this is not new, all right? Every club, every team sport will have training like this. A question I would ask me now is, why isn't your training providing the demands of a game? George, if you say you're doing 15 v 15 training um, and, your game, and the match performance is 15 on 15, why are you not getting it? And the very simple answer is, you cannot get a blanket response across your squad with a large game or with any game, in my opinion. Okay, you might get three out of five players, uh, three out of 15 players doing four kick chases because the ball was on their wing. Their counterpart on the other wing is getting absolutely nothing. Uh, so it's a great question I get from rugby coaches. It's, okay, we'll just keep kicking the ball and make the boys run. There's places to hide. Your whole squad won't get it, 
and you can bet your bottom dollar the lads that don't get it two weeks, three weeks in a row will be the ones to get found out in the game. So my job is to create parts of the session where it might be as simple as cone A to cone B, off you go, run it this fast, really bloody hard, come back in, show she can play rugby under that kind of fatigue. Show she can do your effort habits under that kind of fatigue. All right, this is where we want to be. So this is a very diluted uh, Mesa cycle, I suppose you'd call it. It's, I've only done it eight weeks, otherwise it would be too small uh, to actually see. But what, what we'd quite like to get down to is, and we're not there yet, all right, I'll be completely honest, we are not there yet, is understanding exactly which overload we want um, for, our, for our forwards, for our backs, for our, in our team training. So in our team training, typically in the 15 on 15, that's where we'd get our ball in play overloads, our density overloads and so on. No problem, it's not all done in the, in the overload blocks. Um, I'd also like to quite understand, and I, lo I love this question because the amount of answer variability you can have is incredible, that if you know a team are going to play against you in a certain way, so let's say this team are also going to kick the crap out of the ball back to you and your players are just going to ping pong all day long, which happens, okay? We had 30 kick chases in one game against Irish at Christmas. Um, it happens. What do you do in that week leading up to the game? My head coach would say, let's practice that game plan. We need to put our players under the same pressures, the same stresses from a technical point of view that they're going to get in the, in the game. Sounds good, okay? And I have to say, yep, that is a good idea because it is, it makes sense. We want to practice the game plan. Um, I wish we played one game every month and we could periodize our training. Footballers, you have it a lot worse with, I don't know what Liverpool doing, like 63 games in a season. Um, I've no idea when you practice a game plan for a single game, right? Kudos to you. But from a physical point of view, we ping pong all Tuesday, we ping pong all Thursday. We know that fatigue is specific. What's going to happen? We're going to get out there and we are going to fail physically two days later, okay? Because we practice the physical part of our game plan so well. And it'd be great to have a discussion on this at another, another point because there's a myriad of answers uh, that, you can, that you can come up with and loads of different styles. The answer always is, it depends. It's a balance, all right? It's always the, it's always the right answer but getting into the minutiae of that is a lot more fun. All right. Uh, uh, sorry, earlier I said to you that um, something I have to be really good at if I'm not going to test my players physiologically is that I'm going to make sure that we are constantly feeding back on if we thought the session provided a decent stimulus or not. So this was all about creating uh, loads of habits per player. All right, so... I've got my uh, overload table here. This is actual feedback we gave to the, the coaches. They get feedback every, every day from every session that we do, and the feedback varies depending on what the goals were at a session. Um, there's my three different habits, bolt, reload, fat. It doesn't matter which one's which. Um, and I color code it as to if that player got more habits in that three minutes than they would in our highest three minutes of a game. We did okay from the blue team's perspective. Important thing is here, uh, we're still working on this, that we did better than before. So there's progression with overload, key part of training principles. We are looking to improve our players rather than just hold a steady line of training every week. So that overload block in week one was not good enough. 3.4 involvements per player, way better in week two. Love it. Peak 90, here's some examples. So I believe the one on the, the left... What have I done here? Sorry, <laughs> you've got forwards and backs. This is just a snapshot of a training session, really flipping good session from a peak 90 point of view. Um, and that was from using a combination of an overload, a short overload with a kick chase element, run from cone A to cone B, simple as, um, and then going straight in to a kick chase constrained game designed, designed by one of the skills coaches. Spot on, we got a fairly blanket approach, way more greens than whites. Not usually that easy for us to get. Okay, 
from a physiological point of view? Is our density, is our ball in play, are our rest periods spot on? So this was from before um, I really made it alert. I really made the coaches alert to the importance of this, this stuff. This is, uh, it looks like a, a primary school child has created this. Um, it's about the extent of my artistic talents, but this is how um, I would engage the coaches in feedback on um, whether we, we hit target thresholds. So we use 85%. We're, we read some research one day, one place saying 85%, we're probably gonna stimulate stroke volume adaptations. So we look at 85% to be a um, adaptation, stimulus driving um, place we wanna be during our tough ball in play periods. This was, let's say week one of us trying this out. Absolutely pants, all right? Zero, stimula zero stimulus here. We know in a game, boys are in that red zone for 65 minutes, okay? Fast forward five or six weeks later, we've evolved, we've fed back, we've improved the sessions. This is exactly what we wanted to do. Here's my four drills down the bottom, and here is where we were. We had to add a little uh, Stormers drill as a, as a little 5v5 game. We added that in just before uh, the phase play to ensure that they went into phase under a specific physiological stress. Uh, we wanted to test skill level that day, so that was the idea. And I wasn't afraid to say, and I'm not afraid to say to you, that was a successful session from a stimulus and adaptation, hopefully adaptation point of view, as long as we're consistent. Uh, this, is, this is our effort habits. I was gonna talk a little bit about um, player engagement and so on, but that doesn't need to really be spoken about. Okay, questions I'm gonna explore in the future. I'm still not sure we're getting number one right all the time especially from an individual point of view, which links onto number two. Can I design a test that individually profiles rugby players? I will challenge myself to that for sure. And then the next one is rugby isn't a case of isolated events. So malls, yeah, they're isolated. They happen, then they don't. Scrums, they happen, then they don't. A kick chase might happen after the player has received two contacts and then they've got to go into two contacts. So how can we evolve the whole piece around um, overload blocks in training to create a combined point of view. But then, yeah, as you start adding things into an overload, the intensity, uh, density or volume of that decreases. So are you still hitting your peak periods? Lots and lots of questions. Here's an idea for a test. I just haven't put the bits and pieces together. Hopefully in uh, 24 months time, we'll, we'll have something ready to be published. Absolutely not, can't be bothered with that. So we'll look at a max effort event because I want to know their peak capacity that day. We'll fatigue them. We'll do the event again under fatigue. We'll fatigue them with volume and, and density. We'll do the event again. We'll fatigue them, event, long recovery, event. We'll take heart rate at different periods. I stole this idea of Matt Reeves at Leicester City. Um, I'm not afraid to say that. It's an absolutely bloody brilliant idea from him. Can I make it rugby specific? Can I use those yellow periods? Can I replicate contact? I don't think I'll be able to. Um, we'll see where we go. And that's just me being honest. Okay, that was the journey. And that's me all done. Thank you very much. Any questions for George? Everyone? Go on, Mark. Okay. Very good. Very short question. Uh, you were talking a lot about the physiology, the physiological aspect of uh, rugby. Okay, and uh, you use GPS uh, to evaluate, obviously, what happened during the training, during the matches. And you were talking about a parameter in particular, high metabolic load, how, how metabolic load distance or metabolic power. Uh, as you know, the model has been created for football originally. And uh, say the algorithm will respect a bit more, say, that typology of uh, physiological uh, say, demands. But the biomechanics of running, of movement in rugby and football are different. Does uh, this thing worry you when you analyze this type of metric for your player? Have you done uh, maybe any other additional analysis to apply this model to rugby? And uh, yes, tell me a bit what you think about yeah. these uh, yeah. purposes. You're spot on, 100%. When used in isolation, useless. Um, because a player may have been in 50 contacts versus one that's been in 10 contacts, 
We just use the GPS data. That's where I got in trouble. Uh, in trouble. That's that's where uh, a massive player revolt at uh, Glasgow, right? With with what I was doing. Okay. So you're absolutely right. Um, it is probably the best of a worst case scenario with regards to locomotive metrics for rugby players. So it accounts for some acceleration, some deceleration above certain thresholds. You know this, sorry. Um, I'm hopefully with Statsports designing something a little bit different, but it's complicated. How are we going with that roof? We, is it off the email? Yeah, yeah brilliant. Okay, no. So no is the answer. Um, yeah, we, we, just, we just can't trust locomotive metrics that much. They just don't matter that much to us, which is why I went down there watching, counting collisions, counting habit efforts, when they're done well, when they're done not, as markers of work rate, effort, total volume, and, and so on. What I will say about uh, HMLD is that players who do more of it in training do more of it in games. So their ability to be more explosive. And the, probably the reason there is that their force generating capacity or their fitness is higher. So they're able to get above the thresholds that HMLD has set more often. And therefore those numbers clock up a little bit quicker. So is it a correlation because we are testing them on what we're measuring them on as, as such? Uh, probably. Um, they are, they are probably our better players as well around the park. They probably fill the, fill the gaps more often and make fewer mistakes in the habit efforts. So there is something there. Um, I wouldn't throw the baby out of the bathwater with, with, it, with it. I have done, I've wanted to in the past, um, but my boss, Pete Atkinson, is, is very smart around this. We've kept it in there. It's, 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 it's probably borne some fruit, to be honest, yeah. But you're spot on, it's bloody difficult, yeah.